Lord bless you, brother. Happy to be in tonight in the Southside Assemblies of God to worship with you people, enjoying this fine fellowship that you are no doubt constantly enjoying. Just being a little tired, we was down last night at, um, at uh, Tucson for the banquet down there, and we certainly had a, a wonderful time. The Lord blessed us, and I've been living on the good part of it all day long. So now I met, heard someone last night. I never knew Brother Carl Williams' son. I was today just bragging on that certain young man. I got up and was talking about the, the young people's rally, and uh, I told my daughter, I said, now you want to make it your business to get in there. She said, I don't know nobody in there. I said, you'll know somebody or everybody will know you. Just go on in anyhow. And I'm praying that she receives the baptism of the Holy Ghost during this rally up there. So I said, that fine young man standing there, he's his face shining with the glory of God. And I was repeating it to Billy, and he just stood and looked at me and said, Daddy, don't you know who that was? <laughs> that was Brother Carl Williams. <laughs> well, that, I'm... I know you have come from good stock. This year. <laughs> so glad to be in Phoenix tonight. Well, if there ain't Brother Pat Tyler, where in the world did you come from, Brother? <laughs> I suppose hitchhike from New York here. That's just about the way it goes. I remember seeing Brother Gene, Brother Leo here tonight, Brother Ed Dalton, many of my friends around here, and Brother Ed Hooper. And my, up here tonight, I got a good view of everybody and can look around fine. Well, I'm getting a little bit tired. Uh, been going quite hard, and so we're, we're long hours. And, and I, my wife said, say, I know she begin to talk in your second voice. I said, I had to call on it this time. Uh, sometimes when I talk, I go down and talk deep in my throat, then... That part gets sore and wore out. I come up the top part and talk from there out. <laughs> we just have to learn all kinds of things when we're just working for the Lord, don't we? When you wear out. My, I hope all these are ministers back here. If it is, my, we're right in good keeping tonight. <laughs> Such a fine bunch of men setting together. Well, that reminds me of the promise that we're setting together in heavenly places, Christ Jesus where his blood cleanses us from all sin. Now, I'm going to try truly to let you out early tonight. Remembering now that tomorrow night we're over to um, Brother Shores. Is that his name? Brother Shores uh, at uh, Levens and Garfield. That's another assembly of God out there, the assembly of God there. And the first assembly of God. And then... I'm just going to listen to these other guys for a while now until next Sunday morning, I suppose. Over to the convention. Now, we're going to have a wonderful time. I just feel that we are we're going to have a good time. And my purpose being here is kind of all kind of pinch hitting, you know, going around helping every place and a little fellowship with the brethren and have a night here and there to let get acquainted and, and maybe a little revival spirit begin to strike the people and then make that lead up what we can into there and then the great climax. And I think Brother Oral Roberts is uh, the person this time to bring the climax at the banquet next Monday night. And when I know we're expecting a great time and all through the rest of the week. So you pray for us now and go out in the streets and the hedges and the highways and Ask them? No. Compel them. <laughs> compel them. Compel them to come in. For this would be a wonderful time for Phoenix to get its great visitation at you. And I know that God is willing when we are ready. When we are ready. That's, that's why we these revivals are, to try to meet conditions and get prayed up and get ready for this thing to happen. Now... Just before we approach the Word, let's speak to the author as we bow our heads in prayer. 
Now, with our heads and hearts bowed to God, I'm sure in an audience of this size, there is bound to be many requests. And if you have one and like to be remembered to God, just raise up your hand and in behind that say, Lord, remember me. Our Heavenly Father, you know what is behind each of these hands. You know what flashed on their mind. And thou art more than able to answer each request. And we pray that you will grant it, Lord. We ask that your favor will smile upon us tonight in the way of the pouring out of the Holy Ghost upon us. And remembering, Lord, that tomorrow night in the, uh, uh, the first assembly of God that you'll pour out your blessings again upon us. And then over at the Ramada, the finishing up of the week, oh God, may there be literally hundreds saved. Grant it, Lord. May there be such a, such a pouring out of the Spirit till the newspapers cannot hold their peace any longer, but they'll have to publish to the public what is being done. Grant it, Lord. Just make yourself known to your people, Lord. May their humble hearts reach out by faith and believe that we will receive these things that we're asking for. And then we would pray, Lord, for the ones who would like to be here tonight and cannot get here. They're sick and afflicted and, and in such conditions that they couldn't get here. We pray for them, Lord. May the Holy Spirit visit each and every one. Bless these brethren who have come for such a long ways across the icy fields, and many still on the road coming. Protect them, Lord. Bring them in safely. Now, bless this assembly, this fine pastor, this congregation, this trustees, deacons, and all that they stand for, Lord, we pray that you will be with them and help them. Now we pray that you will give us thy word. We can only read it, Lord, and read the text. Thou hast to furnish the context, and we're looking to thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. In the, the book of 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, if someone, you know, you usually like to read or mark down a place, say, uh, uh, maybe someone would find something behind it that they could maybe improve on what's been said or the ministers, and sometimes the laity takes it and, and reads it over and listens to what's been said. Many times I do that, mark down a text. So if you wish to read behind us tonight, turn to 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, and we'll begin reading at the 23rd verse. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This is the cup of the New Testament, and my blood, this do you, as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And now for a text I like to take from there, remembering the Lord. Now, of course, any we all know in, in our church, we read this at the communion service each night. And it is a, a, a great text to read or a great scripture at that time. And it applies there, but I just wanted those words in remembrance of me. Now, communion has many times been the great dispute uh, down through the ages. Uh, between uh, Protestant and Catholic. They say the Catholic takes this communion and they uh, take it in hopes that they have did something to merit 
some good thing that their sins will be forgiven by doing it. The Protestant takes it as uh, in remembrance that Christ has already forgiven them, and they take it in rejoicing that they're already forgiven. Paul goes on to say in here that that uh, how to come to the Lord's table. If there's anything wrong, make it right before we get there. And for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And now we are very, very much to be in prayer when we take communion. But I've wondered many times if that word we use it just right, communion. Now, commune means to talk to. See? to commune with. And I wonder if really when we meet together like this in heavenly places that that isn't communion, that we are communing with God, talking to Him, and then if we just sit still and let Him answer us back. Uh, many things, and one of the horrible things that I do, I try to do all the talking and, and not sit still long enough for Him to answer me back. We do that so many times in prayer. I think if we would get off of our heart uh, what's in it and express ourselves to the Lord Jesus and then just kneel and s just be still a while and, and just see what he would say back to us. See? And sometimes I have did that and my whole opinion was changed. You see? I'd go ask him something. Now, Lord, these people really, they got a, something. I, I believe they want me over there. And I just start praying, and first thing you know, I, I'm just satisfied that that's the Lord's will. But after I pray, if I just, just linger a little while, see? then it's changed altogether sometimes, sent somewhere else. Yeah. Just commune with the Lord. Oh, what glorious fellowship. Just to get down and talk and commune and wait for Him to talk back. And to think of what a great person that is you're talking to, the Creator Himself, and communing with Him who put your life in this volcanic ash that you're living in. And then someday you'll have to leave there, and then it's in His hands where it goes from there on. And you have the privilege now to make your choice which way that soul goes when it leaves. And what a wonderful thing to commune with Him upon the basis of his promises, then hear him commune back to you and say, it's all well. Oh, my, that, that really expresses it right. We don't have to look to any creed. We don't have to look to, to any dogmas. The only thing we have to do is just know that he witnesses back his word, that it's settled, and that's all of it. Then the burden rolls away. I thought of coming to this table that we'd call it tonight. Now I've got to express that it's just as much communion here as it would be taking what we call the Lord's Supper. You know them Eastern people back there has got that thing all mixed up, and uh, and I can't get them straightened out on them. And all up in the north, they take me to when I go to supper, and they say it's dinner. <laughs> I, 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 they say it's breakfast and lunch and, 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 and dinner. Now, where does my supper come in at? <laughs> and they say, oh, that's all. I said, it wasn't. We didn't take the Lord's dinner. He called it the supper, the Lord's supper. And I feel like I missed the meal if you start calling it that way. But now, when we come together in this way, there God comes down, and the, the communion table is actually break, broken bodies, uh, the body of the Lord that we separate among us. Now, that is the literal uh, body of the, uh, the bread that we break, representing the body of Christ. Did you notice on the day of Pentecost what a great thing we have there, that God, who led the children of Israel through the wilderness, he, um, that great pillar of fire, and on the day of Pentecost, this great fire fell and then divided itself among his people. Oh, to think 
how that he wants us to sit together in heavenly places and each one enjoying that warmth of the fire of the Holy Spirit. Cloven tongues set up on them like fire, licks of fire, God dividing himself amongst the church. Oh, what that old, just set our hearts to burning. That's when we can come together in heavenly places. Now, we know that his table where the people sit together and commune with him is like uh, an oasis in a desert. And an oasis in the desert where there's a great spring where weary travelers come and sit around this oasis in the desert and, and refresh themselves and then remembering how it got there. And that's the way it is in the church, that this table of communion where all the blessings of God, the full gospel, everything that God has for his church is brought out laid out among us, and it's like an, an oasis in this hot, burning, sinful desert that we're traveling through. And then when we come in and talk of, uh, re read the menu, and then we see that he turns back around, and he's not fresh out of this or fresh out of that or this struck off, but he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's got everything on the menu ready to give it out. That's the good part. Then we can just look over the menu and just take the whole thing. I just like it. I like the complete course, don't you? I just like to take it. And while we are enjoying these blessings, each one feeling his presence and saying, Amen, praise God, hallelujah, so forth, in that we can remember the one that brought it to us and made it possible, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Remember Him. I think that's what many times that maybe we enjoy so many blessings that we forget just where they come from. Amen. One time I was amazed and went to, uh, with a bunch of Christians uh, of a certain church and they sat down to eat and never returned thanks to God for their food. Well, I thought it was kind of strange, and I went to another house, and they still, they just went ahead and eat. And I, I questioned it, and they said, oh, well, that's just, God just provides that anyhow, see. I said, it reminds me of a hog under an apple tree, you know. The apples will fall off and beat him on the head all day long. He'll never look up to see where they're coming from. And that, you know, we... <laughs> I think it pays us to stop and look up, see where these things are coming from. Oh, how glorious it is to remember our Lord, remember what all He did for us, and remember that there was no one else could make this possible. There's nothing could make it possible but our Lord. And He so freely did it when there was no worthy person. There was no prophet, there was no sage, no potentate, no monarch, no king. No one could do it but the Lord Jesus himself, and he so willingly did it for us. Uh, just remember, he's done it for his children down through the age. Now, let's just talk a few moments on something that somebody would have to remember. I'd imagine way over in glory tonight. There's a man by the name of Noah, and he certainly has a lot to remember of the Lord for. For in the time that when God was going to destroy all the wickedness off of the face of the earth, God remembered Noah, and Noah remembers how he escaped the wrath of God by God's mercy. How that the, the great waters started flowing down the streets and the winds howled and the rocks moved from the mountains and what a terrible storm. Houses blew away and the fountains broke up and God had Noah inside the ark. Now, that ain't a wonderful place to remember him by. Yeah. Yes, to be inside the ark safely secured uh, in the 
presence of God to live with him. Then we could call another group of people, or at least I'd say three, and they were called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How that they had took their stand for God, remembering that he keeps his promise. And how that in this great hour, because of their stand, even their own brethren, many of them had turned off into the world, but they were going to stand regardless. And they took a stand for God. And when the furnace was hit seven times hotter than it ever was hit before, and they was pushed into this furnace, and they can certainly remember that fourth man that was in there with them and kept all the, the heat and the death away from him. There's something about that fourth man. Yeah. Like talk about him a while. <laughs> yes, sir, how that he was the only one could make that possible. Yeah. There was no other person could do it but that fourth man. Yeah. And he was the one that provided life in the jaws of death. Yeah. Amen. And he, he kept the fire blazes back and preserved them. And oh, as long as there can be a memory, and it'll never fade out, so they can remember that great day down in Babylon. There was another man down in Babylon can remember also, and that was Daniel, when he had purposed in his heart that he wasn't going to defile himself with the things of the world. That's a good stand to take. That's where we people ought to take a kind of buckle up the armor a little tighter. Amen. We're not going to defile ourselves with the things of the world. No matter what the other church does ourselves, we're going to buckle it on. We're going to stay right with that word. No matter what comes or goes, we're not defiling ourselves. If the rest of them want to do it, go ahead and do it. If them women want to cut their hair, let them cut it. We're not. <laughs> right. They want to wear a manicure, let them go, or what that stuff is, paint, let them go ahead and do it. We're not going to do it. If the rest of them says they can smoke cigarettes and get by, well, let them go ahead, but we're not going to do it. That's all. The rest of them can go home, dismiss Sunday, Sunday school early for a television program or Wednesday night, omit the whole service for a certain program. No matter what they do, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to take the place like Joshua. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We remember what he did to bring this blessing to us, and we cherish it so much that we cannot defile it in any way. It's a treasure of eternal life that we have, and we by no means want to defile ourselves with the things of the world. Not at all. And Daniel purposed in his heart the same thing, though he become a citizen there, but not by his choice, because he was an alien. And every born-again Christian is an alien just as soon as he's born again because he's heavenly bound. His, his possession lays in heaven. And here some time ago, the wife and I, about two years ago, was uh, Brother Mercer and I would get a little kick out of this just to say, we was over to the shopping center. And, and in our city, is. Uh, all these many religious people, so-called, but we seen a, a woman that had on a skirt, and it was the strangest thing because none of the rest of them seemed to have on one. And, um, and so we know many of them are singing choirs and everything. And, that. and so we, uh, my wife said to me, she said, well, why? And I said, well, you see, they're not, uh, they're not of our citizenship. She said, what? I said, no, they're not of our... said, they're Americans, aren't they? I said, sure, they're Americans. Uh, that may be true enough. And I find in traveling in missions, and missionary you know, around the world, I go into to, uh, uh, Germany. There is a national spirit called... It's a, a German spirit. It's the spirit of the nation. I go up in Switzerland. I find out... Just brothers almost speaking the same language, but there's another spirit, see? And uh, it's a different spirit in Switzerland. Then I come over to Finland, it's altogether a different spirit. 
Then I come to America, there's the spirit of America. That's right. Well, you say, aren't we? She said, aren't we American citizens? Why is it that our people are so and so? And I said, well, you see, honey, you see, each nation lives off uh, on the spirit of the nation. That's the national spirit. She said, well, then wouldn't we be living on the American spirit? I said, oh, no. I said, we are born again. We live on a heavenly spirit. We're holiness, righteousness. And we, we're not Americans as far as that goes because America is just an earthly nation. But when a man of Germany, of Switzerland, or wherever he may be, when he becomes born of heaven, he takes on a heavenly spirit and his nature and his makeup look for things above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Amen. Oh, how we ought to remember that, that he died, that we might be able to be fortified from this thing, inoculated. That's right. A good, healthy plant. You don't need to spray a good, healthy plant. The bugs won't get on it anyhow. That's right. No bugs will bother a healthy plant. It's that hothouse type that has to be sprayed all the time. <laughs> Some kind of a hybrid affair. And that's the way it is today. We have to spray and baby the church too much. It ought to be a rugged individual of Christ, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, born of the Spirit of God. And all the worldly bugs scatter. They don't even fool around in here. <laughs> That's awful rude, but I hope it's a hope. <laughs> kind of a rude expression, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, how Daniel and a purpose in that in his heart. He can well remember the payoff. And someday we'll remember the payoff, too. <laughs> so when he come to remember that in the hour of distress, God sent an angel in the lion's den and closed the mouth of the lions that they could not bother him. What a memory to think about. He had thrown into a lion's den because he had purposed in his heart to serve God and he can remember that. How did it go something like this? God has sent his angel. He's seen the innocence in my heart. <laughs> oh, there you are. The innocence of your heart. God could see that in Daniel and his purpose to do what was right. And he sent his angel and has kept the lines from bothering him at all. What a memory. We could go on and on with that. Let's just remember another person right away here, or a group of people. That's Israel. When Israel had put the, uh, their place or their selves in position to take the stand for God. And there was coming a death angel one night that was going to take the firstborn of every house. And how that Israel was even commanded to remember that the blood was on the doorpost. That was the thing that held back the wrath of God and kept their, uh, them alive, was the blood on the door. It was a memorial. And it always is still a memorial. The blood on the doorpost and on the lintel. What a memorial night that was. And it was to be rehearsed down through the, the ages that was to come that God at that night made a difference between the righteous and the unrighteous. Oh, I don't know whether it be night or not, but there's coming a day when God's going to show the difference between the righteous and the unrighteous. And it'll be a memorial to us to know that the blood is certainly up on the lintel and the doorpost. Now, wherever you look or your understanding, you look with your eyes and see with your heart. That's right. You'll remember you're looking through the blood of the Lord Jesus the way he would look through it. What a time they were... Israel had another thing they could always remember, that when they took their step upon what did Moses say, that great vindicated prophet with the word of God, and when they took their stand to march because they seen God vindicate that the message that he was bringing was the truth, and it was according to the scriptures, and 
God was with him, and he had met this one who had no name, called the I Am. He had really met him because they had seen him working with Moses. And then they had another great memorial, that when they started on the march, there went a pillar of fire before them to lead the way. What a memory they could think of, a memorial thing that they didn't need no compass. Amen. What did I say? <laughs> they didn't need no compass. They had the light of God to lead them. Amen. What a memorial it was to the wise man. How they needed no compass and a star led them. What a memorial it is to us today to have a Holy Ghost to lead us. Amen. Not some creed or some passion or something to lead us or some man-made something, but the Holy Spirit comes in with the high post of the Word and confirms His Word and proves that it is the truth. What a memorial to our hearts to know that the living God still lives. Oh, uh, remembering Him, what He did, led them all the way to the Promised Land, but this is the way. Elijah had a great thing to remember God by. When he had done his duty, exactly what God told him to do, to command the rain and not even do or to fall until he called for it. Went up and sat down by the brook Cedareth in there. He stayed there for all this time. How he could remember that, how was he going to get food through these years? But God served him with the ravens. A God of heaven. No question, where did the ravens get the food? We don't know. Can't tell. The only thing that he just knowed, he just committed himself to God's Word, what he promised him, and God took care of the rest of it. That's all we have to do. Brethren, that's all we need. It's just take him at his word. How is he going to do it? I don't know. But you see, we try to inject our own ideas in here so we mess up. What if he said this other brook down the hill be just as good because it's got more water in it? Mm -mm. Um, what if Abraham would have thought that he ought to take Sodom? It never would have happened, right? But Abraham tucked the way the Lord led him. There's one promise he had to hold to. Elijah could remember when he had done all he could do. He, he had rebuked all the... The women of that day that tried to fashion after the first lady, the president's wife, and, and um, all those things that he had, he had rebuked, and, and they called him an old, I guess, just a, an old simple sort of a fella, and he went, but done exactly what God told him to do, and then it come to a showdown where he said, let's see which these things are right. Yeah. Now, you call the prophets of a Balaam up here, and, uh, and you call his prophets, and let me call on the law. Oh, what a showdown when he knowed his word had promised. What can we say today as Christians in the front of Buddhism, Mohammedism, or anything else? Let's see who's God. Some time ago, down there in India, where we was at at the meeting, and there there had been many people, four or five, come to the platform, and there was no way of estimating how many people were there. And I'd prayed for a little leper. He had no arms, his ears would eat off, and little stubs, and he's trying to hug me. And I hugged him and prayed with him. The Lord told me what was wrong with him and, and about his life, and, and I could see the ray jaws and those sitting out there. They said, that's telepathy. You see, you, you, could, you could tell it the way they were thinking. What they were, what they were going to put back to me. And that day I'd been entertained in the temple of the Jains, where there's about 17 different religions in there, and every one of them against Christianity. And it was nothing to Christianity, but that night God changed the program. <laughs> we got the reading off the menu <laughs> by spring. So the Holy Spirit began revealing, and after a bit, an Indian came by. And he's blind. And I said, the man is uh, blind. We can all see that. 
but he's a married man. He has two sons. I said, I'll spell their name. I, I can't pronounce it. And that was just exactly right. Now, now I could, them what they call holy man and all of them out there and the Mohammedan priests and sitting out there. And so they, uh, they knew then, they thought I was reading their mind, uh, telepathy. And so I happened to look back and this blind man, just a vision above, was standing there looking at me. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, <laughs> you know, God's servant, the Holy Spirit, had already brought the, what the menu wrote. <laughs> I know it was ready to be served. <laughs> now, I said, now they're telling me today that the Mohammedan religion is the greatest in the world and the Buddhas and all. I said, now, I want some of you priest out there, the Buddha priest, the Mohammed priest, come give this man his sight. <laughs> sure. Now, if you see so great, this man is a worshiper of the sun. And we all know, we who believe it, he was wrong. He worshiped the creation instead of the creator. And I said he was wrong, and we know that. But I said, surely the God that's the creator and the man is willing to come and serve that creator. Surely he's ready to manifest himself. Yeah. Now, I want to say something. I wouldn't have said that by no means if I hadn't seen that vision. <laughs> I know better than that. <laughs> you see, that's what we don't want to go pursuing. Pursue means you're advancing without authority. That's why we want to watch when you say, It's thus saith the Lord. Not just an impression, but something you know definitely, positive. The Lord has said it. And I felt very... A console with seeing the vision noted it never failed. And I said, now, the, the, if this man is wrong, now the Muhammad would say he was wrong. And then you make it a, a, a Muhammad. Then Buddha would say he was wrong. And the Sikhs and the Jains and what more, they'd all say he's wrong, but surely there's a right somewhere. Oh, my. Oh, what a glorious thing. Then... I said, now, the one that will give him his sight, he promised he would serve that God. He went blind from looking at the sun because it was sun gods. And, and he thought that paid his way in heaven. Now, we can remember Christ, that he, he suffered not to put our eyes out, but to give us sight. <laughs> so then, and if, no, I said, now, the one that will come and produce this, I'll follow that clan. <laughs> I said, I'll serve the one that gives him back his sight. And that's the quietest group I ever heard. <laughs> Nobody said that. I said, well, there is the Mohammedan priest out there. Now, why don't you come give him his sight? I said, why? It's because you can't. <laughs> and neither can I. But the God of heaven has raised up his son, Jesus Christ, who has showed me a vision just now that the man's going to receive his sight. If it isn't so then I'm a false witness of this Christ. And if he does, then I'm a true witness of him. And you have to re you should repent or you must if you or you'll perish in the clans that you're in now. Yeah. What a time. And I said, now if that's false, then you should put me on a plane and send me back to the United States and never let me in here again. Oh, but when our God came on the scene. <laughs> The man, as soon as I prayed for him, he could see as good as I could. He run, grab the mayor of the city around the neck and begin to hug him. And why, well, it was about four hours. I didn't have shoes, no pockets in my coat, and the militia couldn't hold him back. And there's a stampede, and you should see one. But what was it? The same God. The same God that could call fire, bring fire down to take away his sacrifice and bring his Holy Spirit to confirm his word that it's the truth. As long as you are sure that is the truth. Now, Elijah was positive that was the truth. He had heard the voice of God and there's no question to him. And there's no question in your heart tonight that God still gives the Holy Ghost like he did on the day of Pentecost. It'll happen. If there's no question that he keeps his word and heals the sick, it's got to happen. But you've got to be positive of it. You've got to really see it by the real eyes of faith, then accept it and stand right there. And uh, he had a lot to remember uh, God for when he was... Uh, uh, now he has a lot to remember what he did in them days. 
the immoral woman that Jesus found up at Sychar up there, that she was um, a Samaritan, which is rather a, an off-caste people that really believe God. There's about a half Jew and half a Gentile. And they were uh, a race. They believed in God. And this little immoral woman and her condition, very marred by sin, and one day perhaps it got discouraged with all the traditions of the elders of pots and kittles and washings and so forth. She went out one day to the same old Jacob's well up there, and she was going to let down her, her bucket to get some water. And uh, she changed springs. <laughs> oh, how she can remember that there was one sitting there that said, In him was living water. Amen. What a thrill it was to her when that living well revealed her sins and told her where she was wrong and described what she had did to her. And it put a message in her heart that set her on fire with the glory of God into the city and to the man. Now, you know, that really isn't legal in that country for a woman to go through the streets, and especially a woman marked with immorality. But I'm telling you, when she got cleansed in a drink of that fresh water, you try to stop her. It was like try to, trying to put a, a fire out of... A, house on fire, and it's real dry, and a high wind and dry weather that was really blowing that blaze. And you couldn't stop her because she had found something that was real. Her sins was revealed. And when her sins and wrong was revealed, she can remember tonight in glory. She can remember that there was a spring for her. There was a place where all the creeds and, and the churches had turned her down, but yet she found a noise. She found a place where there's somebody who cares. What a rejoicing and how we can rejoice with her. We who was bound down with creeds that pulled us away from God, and we found a fountain filled with blood, gone from Emmanuel's veins. There we lost all of our starchy condition, and we drank from the fountain and refreshed. We remember the one who paid the price that we could have his spirit upon us, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What a memory to remember by. I imagine tonight that Hagar could have something to think about, too. When she had been put out, misunderstood. Now, there's many of us here can think about Hagar as she or her being misunderstood. Who walks the right life with God? Who takes the straight and narrow way but what knows what to be misunderstood means? I'm misunderstood. Every person, all you brethren, that try to live right, you sisters, you're misunderstood. Your neighbors think you're some old model, and they try to throw off on you. Why don't you attend these societies, and why don't you have these card parties when things in you shun those things? You're misunderstood. So was Agar, misunderstood. And she had her child, little Ishmael. That was the fruit of her womb from a legal marriage to her husband, Abraham. And she was, she was a slave girl. And she'd been given by her mistress, Sarah, to Abraham to wife, which polygamy was illegal in them days. And she lawfully had married the man because she'd been given to him. She'd bore the child just what their hopes was. There's nothing the woman had done out of the way, and yet misunderstood by her mistress and put out into the wilderness to die. What a place to be. And so the water was spent from the bottle. The little Ishmael's throat was beginning to dry. He was crying for water. and got worse than him. Only a mother's heart could hear that painting a cry of a little parched lips in and, and the desert somewhere of her only child. And, 
feeling his little body uh, drying out, and he's dying. No water, just rocks and sand as you would look out here in the deserts of Phoenix. Not a place misunderstood. What a time. There she was, a slave girl to begin with, and it tried to act in the right way that she was supposed to act. And here she's got the baby in her arms, and it dying. And she was so sad, she laid under a little bush and went about a bow shot, and she knelt down to pray. And there appeared a well. Oh, my. The well of him that liveth and seeth me still stands today. It was put there some way. That well still stands as a memorial. I haven't got education enough to pronounce it, but uh, uh, I, I tried a while ago, and I was writing some little notes, and I, I tried to pronounce it. I couldn't do it, but you know what it is. I, I call it one thing, and then I said, I better not say that. I just show my ignorance worse. But the one thing I want to say, I know where there is another well Hallelujah. that was cut down on the day of Pentecost. Hallelujah. It's just as open tonight as it was the time when it was open back there, and the waters is just as fresh. Every man or woman that wants to take the right road with God's Word and walk through the gates. I come to this well remembering Jesus who made it possible that me, an alien, a drunkard son, could come up to that well and be pardoned of my sins and drink of eternal life. Oh, how Hagar must have felt when she seen that well. It saved the life of her and her child. She sure can remember that voice all the days of her life and all, all through time that she can remember. We could go on and on with characters, but let's just think this. Don't miss seeing your well now. Don't miss seeing the spot of refreshment that brings life. Jesus was sent from Herod to, from Pilate to Herod for mockery. What he missed. What, what was the matter with Pilate? And then when Pilate sent Jesus to Herod, and then how foolish Herod was. When he had heard of him, and he'd heard of his ministry, and Pilate being a Jew, or Herod, I believe it was Herod was a Jew, and standing there before him, and there he was standing in the presence of all the prophets that prophesied about from Eden out, standing in the presence and he never asked pardoning of his sin. He never, he never, he never, what if he even thought, he took a second thought of what it, who he was standing before. He never probably knew who, whose presence he was standing in. Well, you say, that was, that was a hard, that's the most foolish thing. It was. It was the most foolish thing that the man ever done. Well, we think of, of how bad off he was, but wait a minute. We have man today do the same thing. Stand by the same fountain. And still make the same mistake that he did. All the prophets for 4,000 years had pointed to him. But he, because he didn't come in the way of their creed said he would come, they cast him out. There he is. Exactly right. It's exactly right. Yes, sir, still cast him out. They don't want nothing to do with it unless it comes according to their book, you know, the way that their textbook reads it, you see. It has to come that way. Oh, all the prophets through 4,000 years that spoke of him, and here he stood before him, and he never said a thing about ask for, for parting. There he is in the presence and uh, the fulfillment of all of the words of the Hebrew prophets, standing right before him, and he never asked for pardon. He just stood there. Oh, that was a terrible thing. But we do the same today, only we stand by him after 6,000 years. We make a greater mistake than Herod and Pilate and, and Caiaphas and 
of the priest of that day. Because we got 2,000 more years of record added. And we still make that same mistake. Just, uh, I, I just, I suppose that, that Herod never even gave it a serious thought. Now I just wonder how serious we think about this. How serious do you try to consider this word? What does that word mean to you? Do you know that is God in print form? But we ride right over for some sort of a creed and say, Days of Miracles is past. Dr. Jones said so, so, so that settles it. And yet this Bible land in every bookstore, per near, Bible stands, churches, and ministers and so forth standing there and read over the top of it and ignore it because of creed. Amen. Try to place it back in some other age. I've made the remark two or three times since being in Phoenix, it struck me so. Man are that way. They always praise God for what He has done and looking forward for what He will do and ignoring what He's doing right now. Amen. They do it. They fail to see it. Now, perhaps Herod could have praised God for what He brought the children out of the wilderness and so forth, and they said, Someday He'll send a Messiah. Glory to God, we'll see Him then. And here He was standing right before them. And they never knew Him. He was in the world, and the world was made by Him. And the world knew Him not. But as many as did receive Him, to Him gave them the power to become sons of God. I like that. Yes, sir. There in His presence. I suppose He never took a, a serious thought about it. And many today do the same thing. Don't take it seriously. They don't take a serious thought. They think, now here, I go to church, and I'm just as good as you are. Now, you just don't want to take that attitude. You could be as good as me and be no good at all. See? But you want to make, not make any man your example. You want to make God your example, Jesus Christ, and you want to take His Word. And if you don't... Now, remember the Bible said over in the book of Revelations, this is a complete revelation of Jesus Christ. Whoever takes one word out of it or puts one word to it, his part will be taken out of the book of life. So that is the revelation. God in sundry times and divers manners, Hebrews 1, spoke to the fathers through the prophets, but this last days through His Son, Christ Jesus. And Christ revealing Himself, making Himself known, taking His Word, and just making it grow. Standing the other day talking, I believe it was Brother Carl Williams. That was a palm tree, I believe it was Brother Carl, someone. And I said, isn't that a beautiful tree? He said, yes. I said, what is it? Volcanic ash. That's all it is. Dust of the earth. With a life in it. And that life was a certain kind of life made it a palm tree. Over here stands another. It's a different kind of a tree. It's a fig tree. What is it? Volcanic ash from the earth with the fig tree life in it. Well, look at us. What are we? The same as that tree. Volcanic ash. But with a human life in it. And that human life is of the earth and must go back to the earth. But there is a life that comes from above that a man lives for that life. It's eternal life. How foolish could not we seriously consider that, friend? Now, it isn't an emotion. It isn't keeping a line of creed. It's an experience. It's a birth. First, you have to experience a death before you can witness a birth. I line that right, experience death, and then witness the birth. Any seed has to do the same thing. And this seed is God. And when it's placed into your heart, it brings forth the birth of a son of God. And that's the way Jesus was when he was on earth. He said, who can condemn me of sin? Who can accuse me of other sin? Sin is unbelief. If, I, if you can't believe me, be the, believe the works. Search the Scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life. They are the ones that testify of me. They're the ones that tell you who I am. And if I don't meet that qualification, just exactly what the Scripture said, the Father said I would be when I come, if I don't meet that, then I've done wrong. Oh, if we Christians, if we ministers, if we men, women, Pentecostals, and the rest of us 
If we can't take what God said his church should be, measure up to the statue that he said, we can be condemned to sin of unbelief. We try to say that the days of miracles is past and all these other things that and so and so, so and so, then we can be accused of unbelief. Yes, that's right. That's right. For there's only one sin, and that's unbelief. He that believeth not is condemned already. Yes. See? You don't even get the first base if you don't believe. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So what if the church, that's what God wants. That's what God will have. A bunch of people that can say, what has Jesus Christ promised? What has been promised in this last days that hasn't been manifested through us? Amen. 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 Then we can sit down and remember Him. Remembering Him when we come together. If there's anything we're lacking, let's do it. If there's anything lacking with us, let's get back to that. Let's remember what He required. Not what we think we ought to have, but what He said we've got to have. We've got to have it that way, the way that He said it. But wonder if we just, we say, well, I, I, I belong to this. And I wonder if you give it a serious thought to know that that don't mean a thing to God. I don't mean nothing. Herod probably, probably said, well, I'm going to wait just a minute here. You know who I am? See, he never thought seriously. And we ought to think seriously. You know what he did? When Christ was placed before him for the first time, that all the prophets, sages, and down through the ages had spoke of this one coming, and there he stood right before him. You know, this, the, on the occasion that God placed Christ before Herod, he only asked for entertainment. I wonder, brethren, let's think seriously now. We Pentecostal people, I wonder if we receive the Holy Ghost just for entertainment wandering around instead of over in the promised land possessing all things. I wonder if there isn't something we haven't thought seriously enough about it. You must think seriously. If Pilate would have did that, he would have released him. If, if Herod would have did that, he would have released him. But he didn't think seriously. His first occasion. And then what did he do? He asked for some tricks. Oh, they, that's what it is today. They want to make Christianity a trick. Some little gimmick that you got in your hand. And listen, Pentecostal people, be deeply sincere in these things. When you speak with tongues and give the interpretation, you be sure that that's interpretation. See? Don't have a gimmick. Why you want a gimmick when God's got the real thing for you? See? Why accept a substitute when the skies are full of the real? We must be sincere. You mustn't try to uh, just kind of uh, ignore it and pass it over. We mustn't do that. We mustn't ask for tricks. We must ask for service. Amen. Amen. Lord, if I'm to be the doormat, make me the best doormat you ever had. Amen. Whatever I am to be, let me be. Amen. Not make me, if I can't be a Billy Graham or an old Roberts, why, well, I ain't going to be at all. See? Why, you're just as much thought of as Billy Graham and old Roberts if, if, you got a, if you're the doormat. If you're God, God needs a doormat, he, he wants a good doormat. That's all. It doesn't matter. But we go along presuming that we're supposed to be this or that. Don't do that. Just ask for service, whatever it is. Whatever it is, let God choose your service. And then when he gives you service, remember that it's Jesus that directed you here. You were born for that purpose. Be a, a good servant to him, wherever it is. Yes, Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord and do not the things that I tell you to do? We ought to study the Scripture. We ought to find out what God's program and plan is. He said, You call me Lord. He said, But why do you call me Lord when you don't do the things that, that I command you to do? See? Yes, Lord is ownership. The landlord owns the, the land. And the people today, they'll gladly accept Jesus for a Savior. They, they don't want to go to hell. They'll, they'll accept Him as a Savior. But when it comes to Lord, oh no. Mm. See, Lord is you to be His property. 
If he wants a floor mat, he makes you a floor mat. And you're just as happy a floor mat as you'd be a morning star. <laughs> See, you, you, you want, we, we want, we don't want to have him Lord. We want a Savior, but we don't want Lord. And then when he comes Lord and he speaks to you about certain things of the Word, but well, I don't know about that now. <laughs> See? Or just, I just can't imagine me doing that. You ladies here. <laughs> You say, I get tired at one. Oh, I'd be like the fellow said one time, he went to preach a revival. He said, he preached on repentance. The third night, repentance. Fourth night, repentance. He preached a full week on repentance. And the pastor of the church, and some of them got back and told him, he said, Brother, we, we really admire your sermon, but haven't you got another? And said, Oh, yes, sir. He said, I got another, but let them all repent, and then I'll preach on something else. So, <laughs> let the church get started on its ABCs, and then we'll go to algebra then. How, how to be prophets and get gifts and so forth like that. But let's first learn this first step first. Learn to walk before you can run, you know. So if you're weary with the footman, what are you going to do? <laughs> All right. But we, we want to remember our Lord. That's what you got to remember, that it's Him you're serving. You don't get these gifts just to have a lot of fun out of them. That's right. That's right. After all, there's many that talk about gifts that I'm sure from the way they act, they don't know what it is. <laughs> The gift, gifts of God and things are not something that's just played with. The gifts of God are gracious and they're weary. They're wearisome. In the presence of God, it's not shouting. The presence of God, that's God's blessings He pours upon you, see? But the presence of God is a troublesome thing. I don't want you to forget to get that tape if you can. Sirs, what time is it? And remember that. Jacob, when he laid on that pillar of rock one night, and the Lord appeared to him in a vision, and he saw angels uh, uh, descending and ascending. When he got up, he said, This is a dreadful place, none other than the house of God. Dreadful place. When Isaiah the prophet had prophesied for many years, or Uzziah, and when Uzziah was taken away from him <clears throat> because he tried to usurp the part of a priest, and he was stricken with leprosy and died. And Isaiah probably is in 40 years old, 50. And he'd been a prophet uh, ever since a b baby because prophets are born. Their gifts and callings are without repentance. And there he was, a, a prophet of the Lord, down in there praying one day and confessing his sins down at the altar. And all of a sudden he came into the presence of God and seen God sitting in the heavens. And his train, he saw seraphims with their holy faces uh, shaded with wings and their feet covered with wings and flying with wings, crying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Yeah. And Isaiah remembered then that his little uh, uh, journey wasn't very much. What did he cry? He noticed his gift. He hadn't acted right with it. He was far away. He said, Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I, I, I dwell among people with unclean lips. And then the angel, see, is a dreadful thing. He said, woe is me. Yeah. Not the thing of blessing and shouting and screaming. That's good. I remember I'm not condemning that. But I'm telling you, that's not what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's the power yeah. and the yeah. presence of God yeah. which brings such a holy fear until you're paralyzed yeah. in His presence. Yeah. You'll always remember you remember it. And Isaiah remembered as long as he lived. I imagine when the saws was cutting through his body, he still remembered those angels crying, Holy, Holy, Lord God. Certainly, Jacob in his last hours could remember those angels ascending and descending, and it was such a dreadful thing to him. It's not what people think it is. It's something different. What we need to do is come into his presence remembering him, that he brought us here not for frolic but for service. Amen. Brought us in here to work for him. He had something to remember. What about Judas is the character? He's got something to remember too. Judas has got something he's remembering tonight. Certainly isn't he'll always remember. Certainly. Why? He sold the Lord Jesus for personal gain. I wonder tonight if there isn't many doing that same thing today. Selling your birthrights for personal gain. When you should be on fire for Christ, 
when you should be doing something for him, working for him or something, you go join somewhere where you can live any way you want to and still claim to be a Christian. That's what the world is looking for tonight. The world, I said, not the believer. The believer is looking for every straight road he can walk in to get right. But the unbeliever is walking somewhere where he can go and just uh, maintain his profession of a Christian and then just live any way he wants to. That's what this nation wanted for a president, and that's what they got. Exactly. That's what, the, that's what the church wants. That's what they got. Yes, sir, that's what you get. But the believer wants to get everything shaved off of him. He wants to lay aside every sin. Amen, Hallelujah. And the weight that easily beset him, he might run with patience a race that's set before him, looking to the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. Yeah, remembering him as we lay aside every weight. Women letting their hair grow. Man, quit being Ricky and come on into church and do what's right and all this other kind of stuff. And pastors with deacons on their board, married three or four times and all these things, compromising because they pay heavy on the plate and all. Have to knock down to some organization because they tell you this is it and the Bible says something different. Lay aside every way. Remember Jesus. He becomes very unpopular. The young rabbi was one of the greatest men in the world of the day when he was healing the sick and doing everything well, making people healed and giving the sight to the blind, showing the people and manifesting God through them that by the thought of their own mind he could speak to them. He was a great rabbi. But one day he sat down and began to tell them the gospel truth. He wasn't pauper from then on. No, he never. And the first thing you know, all the group walked away and then the seven, he said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And they walked away, and then he stood and asked the disciples, Will you go also? And they said, Where will we go, Lord? You alone. We've sold out. We're ready. No matter what it is, we're ready to go. Let's remember him like that. Remember, he was our example. he done everything, condemned every Pharisee, condemned everything in the world, went through the world without a spot on him. He was a lamb examined by God. He said, This is my beloved son. I'm well pleased in him. He lived such a life. And then he took all the sin of the world, my sin and your sin, and laid it up on him. And then even the perspiration coming from his sacred brow like drops of blood spatting on there. Not because that he was guilty, but it was my guilt doing that and your guilt. And if he can do that for you and I, how could we stand up under some dogmas and nonsense of the world and the things of this modern day? We ought to remember our Lord. Yeah. Remember what he paid for this price of salvation. Never be ashamed of it. Be ready to give any man account for the hope that rests within you. We should do that, brethren. We're getting in the last hours now. The sun is setting. Civilizations come from the east. Now it's on the west coast. It can go no further. The barriers there and all the sin of the world is heaping up and rolling up in shameful waves of Hollywood just bounce plumb back into the church and what a time it is. We ought to remember that, brother. Remember our Lord. What would he do if he stood here today? He'd hold to that word. In the midst of every temptation, he stated that word. He did it. He was your example. When Satan come to him and said, turn these stones into bread, he said, it's written. <laughs> Constantly with the Father's word. We must remember and do the same thing. He was our example. Yes, sir. Those priests of that day will have a lot to remember, too. They're remembering it tonight in a world of the lost. You say, Brother Bram, would you call those priests holy priests that they were a godly man? Ah, wait a minute. They made themselves godly. They had a false holiness, a false piety that wasn't really belonged of God. Jesus plainly told him, You are of your father the devil, and his works you'll do. And he told them what they were. And they have a lot to remember, too, because when they seen that genuine manifestation of the Messiah, proving that he was Messiah, they deliberately turned it down and said it was the evil spirit doing that. Amen. Said it was Beelzebub, and Jesus pronounced that that was blasphemy. Whosoever would speak a word against the Holy Spirit would never be forgiven. Amen. They got a lot to remember. Let's not take their place, brethren. Amen. Let our lot not be like theirs. But if I have to be, let me be like Nathaniel's hand. 
Thou art the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Let me stand as one of those. Let me stand. Let you women stand as a woman at the well. How she stands tonight. She's got a lot to remember as we spoke of. She found a fountain. And now those priests, they'll have... Why do they do it? Because of pure green jealousy. That's the only way. They were zealous of their creed. They were, they were zealous of their traditions. Their elders had set up a tradition which was contrary to the Word. And they were zealous of that tradition. Brethren, let's you and I don't have to answer for that. Zealous of any tradition. Let's remember Jesus, what he was. Stay with what he said. But just pure green jealousy, they did these things. Oh, what a thing. Yes, sir. They, the rich man's got a lot to remember, too. He was presented with the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ. But he loved the praises of man more than the praises of God. And remember, the Bible plainly says that he remembered it after he was dead and in hell. And the message come back to him, remember in your lifetime. You had the opportunity. And Phoenix, you got the opportunity. The world's got the opportunity. Don't let it cross your path and you fail to see it like Herod and and many of them did. Now they show that those priests actually knew who he was because Nicodemus expressed it when he come. He was one of the chief of the Pharisees. He said, Rabbi, we know that your teacher comes from God because no man could do those things except God was with him. Amen. See, they knew it. But see, they got to remember that. They knew better but didn't do it. Let your creed hold you down from the baptism of the Holy Spirit because they tell you there's no such a thing. Here a few months ago, I was out at the hospital to pray for a woman in our city in Indiana. And there was a little lady laying there wanting to get right with God. She had been, she's a backslider. She once come to my church. <clears throat> she went back out. And of course, seven devils entered worse than ever was in there. She's laying in the hospital dying. She said, Brother Branham, I don't want to die like this. And I said, all right, sister, you don't have to. If you still got a desire in your heart to serve God, he's never left you. You left him, but he never left you. Now you can if you can. She said, I, I want to, Brother Branham. I said, all right, we'll pray. There's another lady laying there with her lips down, looked at me with a, like she could run through me. And her and her son, and she was lying on the bed going to an operation the day before. And I said, uh, and I see her looking at her son, looking over at me. And, and I said, do you mind if we have a word of prayer? She said, pull that curtain. I said, well, uh, are you a believer? She said, I said, pull that curtain. I said, I just asked you, she said, I'll give you to understand we're a Methodist. I said, well, that certainly expresses it then. <laughs> see, what was it? She didn't want to see some other person, that poor backslidden woman, come back to God. Now, she'd been a Methodist, it'd been different. You see, didn't remember Jesus there, you see. She just remembered her creed, just remembered. All right. Oh, what a horrible thing it'll be in that day of the judgment. A few weeks ago, I was riding on an elevator in Louisville. I was going up for an examination, a physical examination, to a doctor friend of mine to get a, a, a pass so I, if I want to go overseas with Brother Roll and, and right away. And so I, I thought I'd take my physical while I had a chance. And I went up, and there's some man with us going up on the floor. We went way up about eight floors in Louisville and, uh, so at a building. And uh, so uh, the Hayburn building, and when I was up just by as high as we could get the stop, these, one of these fellows is drinking a little, I think. He looked around and said, well, boys, I guess this is as high as we'll ever get. I said, we better get off. I never said nothing. He didn't know I was a preacher, so I just waited to get off. I said, just a minute, that remark you made, I said, if we're trusting in our own merits, this is as high as we'll ever get. But I said, if we'll trust in Jesus, <laughs> remember him. Amen. We can go higher. When we pass, as a brother outlaw singer said the other night, Jupiter, Venus, Neptune, Mars, the Milky White Way, and go on and on and on. There's no difference. Beyond every solar system into the heavens of heaven. I'm glad for that. Just remember that he went on and above such things as that. Yes, we're trusting in our merits. We're certainly lost. 
But if we trust in his marriage, we're saved. Oh, we can remember Jesus in his grace that he lifted us up and promised it. That even now, right now, we don't have to be earthbound. See, we're not earthbound now. We're heavenbound. We're already dead. Our lives are hidden in him through Christ. And we're raised with him. Not, we're, not, we're not dead with him. We're raised with him. And we're sitting in heavenly places. Remembering him. Sitting in heavenly places. When, Brother Branham? Right now. Yeah. We won't be raised with him. We're already raised with him. This is the first fruits of our resurrection. Pass from death unto life and alive forevermore. Sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus already raised with him from the dead. Yes. What a glorious thing it is to be sitting in heavenly places with, with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Yes, sir. We can remember him now and all of his promises that he made us while we're sitting right here now. I was looking at that clock back there, and I thought, Mom, I'm doing real well. I'm getting done here now. Seven o'clock. I had about three more pages of notes, and I pushed them back under here when I looked down at my watch to see if it wasn't seven o'clock. So I thought, I'm doing real well. Where have I been? Have I been lost all this time? I know that I felt awful good, but I didn't know I felt that good. <laughs> but I'd, I kept looking at that clock, and I thought, there's something wrong somewhere. Well, that's what's going to happen one of these days, friend. Time is going to stop. And we're going to take our sky ride into eternity where there's no more time. Want to be wonderful? But while we're sitting here now where time means nothing to us, we're already lifted up in heavenly places. What can we remember? We can remember every promise that he made us. If ye abide in me and my words in you, you can ask what you will. I can remember St. John 5, 24. He that heareth my words and believeth, not make believeth now, but believeth on him that sent me hath, that's present tense, everlasting life, and shall not come into the condemnation or judgment, but pass from death unto life. And we're living right now in Christ Jesus, sitting in the heavenly. That's what he promised. We can remember... We can remember how he told, made himself known as the Messiah amongst the people. The believers saw it. And we remember then St. John 14, 12, and he said, He that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also. We can remember he promised that. We can remember he promised in the last days that the Holy Spirit would be manifested in human flesh. Just exactly like he did in Sodom before it was burned. We remember Jesus made that promise. I remember it. He said so. Jesus said, so I believe it just as much as if I sat right there and he told me about it. Because it's right here and that's the way I believe that word. I remember he said so. That's all. The works that I do shall he do also. I remember I was reading in the scripture the night where Jesus said, when I have many things to reveal to you, tell you, but you, I can't do it now. But when the Holy Ghost has come, you see, he will bring these things back to your remembrance and then he'll show you things that's going to come. I remember that the Holy Spirit spoke and said, The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the sunder and the mire of the bone, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. I remember that Jesus passed through a crowd one day, and a little woman touched his garment and went out there and sat down. And I remember stood up or wherever she was, and Jesus turned and said, Who touched me? When Peter thought he went out of his mind, he said, Well, I rebuked him and said, Well, everybody's touching you. He said, But I perceive I got weak. Uh, a virtue's gone. He looked all around. He found the little woman, told her her a blood issue. Her faith had saved her. I remember that the Bible teaches in Hebrews that he is now a high priest. Oh, that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. That's right. I remember the Bible said in Hebrews 13, 8, I'm remembering Jesus. He made, then Hebrews 13, 8, he said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, how we can remember him. Yes, sir. Oh, how we... Yet a little while, and the world sees me no more. Yet ye shall see me, the church, the believer. For I'll be with you, even in you. 
to the end of the world. That's right. I will never leave you. Oh, it's not just something that happens today and gone tomorrow. It's eternal. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Oh, my. I would make a scream, shout, cry. We want to consider this seriously. Remember Jesus, not just in a haphazard way. He promised this. And if that is no good, then the Bible's no good. And then what are we sitting here for? What are we even living for? What are you trying for? What's your efforts for? What are you sweating it out for? If it's any right at all, it's either every bit right or none of it right. Remember, it wasn't you or I or your pastors that made the promise. It was Jesus made these promises. I remember he said it. I remember he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. How far? All the world. Yeah. Two-thirds of it don't know nothing about Christ yet. All the world to every creature. These signs shall follow them that believe. I remember he said that. And if I can remember that, how can I accept something then that says that that day is gone? I remember he said to all the world, every creature, and these signs shall follow them that believe. How can I put myself with a group of people that deny that word when God was watching over his word to vindicate it? How can I hook myself up with unbelievers? Uh, oh, God, let me remember Jesus. Let me remember the stand that he took. Let me remember that he is my Savior. Let me remember that I'm dead. I'm no more. I've been dead 33 years. This is Christ that lives within me. And if I look out and see him doing things uncommonly, unseemly, then I know that I never died. William Branham's still alive. You're still alive. As long as you're disobeying his commandments, then you're still alive. But when you're obeying his commandments, if you love me, keep my sayings. How oh, wonderful to think that he promises yet a little while and the world won't see me no more. The world won't see me. But yet you'll see me. Oh, wherever two or three are assembled together, I'll be in their midst. I remember that. You remember that, brother? And the works that I do, they'll do it also. What kind of works did he do? There you are. See? Oh, well, of course not, Brother Bram. That was for another day. It's, it's not that. I remember that's what he said. I don't remember what you said. That's all gone. See? But I remember what he said. He that will come after me will deny himself. Deny his own thoughts. Deny his own thinking. You could deny your father, your mother, your wife, your children. But there's something so real that you can't deny that. It keeps you. And he's here. Now let's just remember every promise that he made as we bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, there was many requests just a few moments ago. Uplifted hands come up from all over the building. But Father, thou art the living God. And I pray thee, Lord Jesus, to bless these people. May your Holy Spirit dwell upon them. Give to them eternal life. Give to them what they have need of. Let us remember you made the promise. You are the one that's responsible for this promise. Let us remember no matter what anyone else says, you are the one. You are the one that we're looking to, to fulfill your promise. You're the one said that he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I remember you said that, Lord. And then you said those who did believe in you. Now, you said if we believe, we had eternal life. And you said those that did believe in you, the works that you did, they would do also. Now, Father, we know that you're God, and we know that there's none other but you, and we believe you, and we are trusting you now in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, with your heads bowed, how many in this building that knows that 
you're not remembering your Lord in the way that you should remember him. And at the end of this little chopped up message, you're willing to raise your hands and say, God, make yourself so real to me till I remember you up on my, your commandments will be on my bedpost. I put the Lord always before me. As David said, Lord, give me more of you that I can remember you. Put up your hands and say, pray for me, brother. That's almost unanimously everywhere. Lord Jesus, be merciful to me. Now, is there those here tonight who has never confessed him as your Lord? And now you might stand before him. And we've told you just a few moments ago that he promised that where two or three are assembled, I'll be in their midst. Now, he promised that. Then he's got to be here. And you never accept him as your Lord. Will you do that rational thing that Herod did? Will you give that commitment that Pilate did to brush him off on somebody else? My mother, she was a Christian. My daddy got enough religion for all of us. Would you do that? My wife is a religious woman. What about you? Will you raise your hands and say, God, remember me. I'm a sinner. And I want to be right with you. I'll raise my hand. How many hands in here that's that way? Is there? You mean there's not a sinner in the building? God bless you, lady. God bless you, lady, here. There you are. I thought there was something pulling wrong here. I, you understand that Jesus said he was here, and he knows your thoughts, you see, in your heart. Thank you for your sincerity. Really, there's more that should raise their hand. But uh, would you raise your hand then? Say, Brother Branham, I, I'm just playing the part of hypocrisy. I go to church, but when it really comes to being born again, I'm just joined church. I really don't know Christ. I still love the world as much as I ever did. I, I just, oh, I enjoy going and listening to a message or something, but when it really comes to taking time and loving to go out and spend hours in prayer with Him and commune with Him remembering Him, oh, yeah. I, I don't do that. I don't even have the desire to do it. I know then, Brother Bram, I can't be right and have that kind of a feeling. So I'm raising my hand to God. Be merciful to me. Raise your hand. Be honest with me. That's right. God bless you. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Lord bless you. Amen. Let me just wait and see if the Holy Spirit would reveal something else. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Sure, I just want him to search your heart. That's what he's here for. All right. God bless you, little lady. That's very fine. Just as you think of it, take it seriously now. Oh, Brother Bram, I, I got to hurry home. Listen, you're going to hurry out of this life one day, too. Think of it now. This is the hour. This is the time. You say, well, I tell you, our pastor, he's a, he's a brilliant man, very educated. I'd rather hear it from It don't make any difference who brings the message. It's, it's not the messenger. It's the message you hear. See? No matter what type of a man would walk in the door there and, and give you a message that it, uh, you, you inherited a million dollars, you'd accept the, the money. Uh, you accept your pardon. With your heads bowed now and your eyes closed, I'm going to ask you something real sincerely now. I want you to tell me the truth. Women, you wearing short hair, how many really feel that you should have long hair? Raise your hand. God bless you. That's good. I know you did. I, I, this hope's for you. But when you're so seared that you can't do it, you don't even feel to condemn. See? Then there's something happened to you because the Word said you should. How many of you women wear shorts and them clothes or smoke cigarettes and... And you man, too, that know that you're doing wrong. And you say, I don't want to do that, Brother Branham. I really love God, but I, that, that thing is holds on to me, and I know it's an evil thing. I'm going to raise my hand, and, and raising my hand, I'm asking God to move it from me. Raise your hand. Be honest. God bless you. That's right. Yeah, that's, right. that's sincerity. That's honest. God will give us a healing meeting in a minute on that sincerity. We can believe that. Have faith in God. Heavenly Father, you've seen the hands. You know the conditions of the people. You know what's all in their hearts, Lord. 
I pray that you give forgiveness to every one of them. And now give to them the desire of their heart. Move their heartaches. Do that, Lord, which they have need of knowing. I pray that you'll grant it to them. Through the name of thy beloved Son, our Lord Jesus, we ask it for God's glory. I commit them to thee, Father God, that you will perform your work in them. Through Jesus Christ's name, amen. Now, as you raise your head, how many feel lots of difference about it? Raise, just raise your hands. I feel lots of difference. Now, how many knows that he promised that he, he's the Lord heals all of our diseases? Do you believe that? Would you... How many of you believe that he promised this, that a little while in the world won't see me anymore, no yet you'll see me? You believe that? Do you believe it's possible then, if Hebrews 13, 8 years said, Jesus Christ, same yesterday and forever, you believe it's possible that we could see God? How would we see him in the manifestation of his Spirit, his living being? Would you believe that? I'm going to ask my brother not to pray on this back there. Only pray for me. That's the audience this time. We're coming on to the meeting in a few days. And we're or maybe catch that. I want this audience in one control. I want to take these spirits under my control in the name of Jesus Christ for his glory, that his spirit might operate and prove to you that he still lives. Yeah. I take his word here. It said that St. John, uh, St. John, the 14th chapter, 12th verse said, He that believeth in me the works that I do shall he also. You believe that? Then every one of you people out there that's sick or needy or have need of something, you pray. Just touch, remember, the hem of his garment. He's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Does the Bible say that, brethren? And then how would he act if he was a high priest the same way he did when he was here? Because he's the same high priest. How would he do it when his body is a sacrifice on the throne of God? How could he do it? He sent his spirit back, the Holy Ghost. And he will take the things that's mine and show them to you. Now, if you want to see if God, the reason I base this upon this, knowing this, I know that the message that I preach to the people is the truth. I, I, I believe that with all my heart. Though it cuts off here a little bit that way, not to be mean, not to be different, but to be honest. And therefore, I know he said that if he would take the things that was of God in this order to make you to know it. If he take the things that is of Christ and will show it to you and show you things to come and do the very works that he did, that's the Holy Spirit. It's got to be. Pray now. And you touch his garment. I'll yield myself to him and see what he will say to you. Just pray. Is there some here that's never been in the meeting before? Would you raise your hand? Yes, there's plenty. Remember, Jesus Christ never at one time ever claimed to heal people. He said, it's not me that doeth the works, it's my Father. And in St. John, the fifth chapter, the 19th verse, when he passed through the pool of Bethesda, and there lay great multitudes of, of numbers of people, maybe thousands laying there, lame, blind, halt, twisted. He went to a man that had a, maybe a prostrate trouble, or might he had a tubercular. He was retarded. He'd had it for 38 years. And he told him, take up your bed and go into the house. The man could walk. He said, when I'm coming down, somebody else. And there's a man there way worse than he was. But... Jesus knew that he was there and knew that his that condition. When he was questioned, he said, Verily I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself but what he sees the Father doing. That doeth the Son likewise. That's the same position today. No prophet, no one has ever been able to do anything outside of the sovereignty of God's will. That's right. What God will. I don't know. I won't. If that's the reason I know a bunch of these ministers sitting here. There's not too many out there that I know. If I should see him over someone, I would try to. If being willing, I'd tell the people that I knew him. You pray and see if he's still the high priest that can be touched. That would pull him right here before us. You'd see that he's here. Is that right? Say amen. It would certainly make him here. Just have faith. Here's a little lady sitting right here with her head up in the air, praying just as hard as she can. She's wearing her green coat, sitting right there. She's praying for her condition. It's in her head that she, it bothers her. Is that right, lady? Raise up your hand if that's so. If I'm a stranger to you, wave your hand back and forth. It's left you now. <laughs> Say, will you do me a favor while you're there? 
That light switched right over on the lady sitting next to you there. She's praying also. I want to ask you something. You said, remember me, Lord. All right, he has. You suffer with a scientist condition. If that's right, raise up your hand and wave your hand. All right. There you are. You believe? Now, a little while the world won't see me no more. Ask those women. You see them? Ask them if I know them. Here, here sits a young man sitting here praying for his father. I never know you. don't know who you are. No, know nothing about you. But you're praying to your father. He's not here. He's across a great water somewhere. He's suffering with stomach trouble. He's in Puerto Rico. That's thus saith the Lord. That's right. Do you believe it? See what I mean? Here's the lady saying you're look, interested in the red hat. Mrs. Aldridge. Aldridge. Uh, yes, you suffer with heart trouble. You believe that God will heal you? All right. You do me a favor. There's a lady sitting next to her by the name Miss Cook. Mrs. Cook has got trouble with her legs. That's right, Miss Cook, raise up your hand. If I'm a total stranger, raise up your hand. All right, have faith in God. Lay your hand on the woman next to her. She's Miss Russell. She's suffering with lung trouble. Raise up your hand, Miss Russell, and believe it with all your heart if I'm a stranger to you. What about the next? The you know, only thing you have to have is faith. The lady next to her is suffering with stomach trouble, too, and her name's Miss Dillman. You believe with all your heart you can be. Miss Harmon sitting next to her has just come from the hospital. She's had an a operation for a, a rectal trouble. You believe, Mrs. Harmon? If you do believe with all your heart, you can go home and be made well. How many believes now? A little while. And the world will see me tomorrow now. What am I trying to say? Remember Jesus promised. Jesus said, I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. The works that I do shall you also. Remembering Jesus promised these things, Jesus brings them to pass. Now, also remember that Jesus promised that he that believeth on me has everlasting life. You that raised your hand a while ago after this healing service, will you come up here now and stand here for prayer? He promised to give eternal life. His name's he promised healing. Now, did you know he promised this also? These signs shall follow them, it believe. If they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Do you believe that? Now lay your hands on one another then. See, he's your, I can't heal you. He's already done it. Now put your hands on somebody and pray for somebody right next to you there. Amen. Now bow your heads and pray just like you do in your church. Pray, Lord God, heal this person. This person's praying for me. And just ask God to heal and make well. Believe it with all your heart. Lord, I believe Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word can't fail. Remember, he promised a little while and the world won't see me. They don't see him at the dog race tonight. They don't see him in the picture show. They don't see him in the churches. But you see him. He's here. Remember, he promised it. And he's here to answer your prayer and give you the desire of your heart. Lay your hands on one another and pray. Lord Jesus, I come remembering that you said in my name they shall cast out devils. And I cast every spirit of unbelief away from this audience, away from these people. For the glory of God.